Hi, um, thanks, Nancy. I'm just going to get started. So, um, am I getting started? I think I'm getting started. Um, yeah, so as an artist, I try, try to get you to think of the world around you, but maybe in a way that you're not thinking of. So this is a mapping plan of um, the terrain above and below sea level at the San Francisco, at the mouth of the Golden Gate Bridge. Turned into a permanent drawing in space for the California Academy of Sciences, made out of marine grade stainless, so you can eat lunch and understand that you are above and below sea level. We're a very visual creature if we can see it. We understand it better, so I try to get you to think of things that you might not be thinking of. Another example is, clicker is not liking me. The Chesapeake Bay, again, I'm obsessed with waterways like Leah is, I wanna talk to you later. Uh, but again, we tend to think of waterways, we know what's, where we live on that river, but are we thinking of what's upstream from us or are we thinking of what's downstream from us? So oftentimes in my work, these are just marbles glued to a wall. It's called Folding the Chesapeake. It was part of a group show called Wonder. And um, it decided to flow like water wherever it wanted to. It sort of misbehaves and doesn't play along with gravity, but it's called Folding the Chesapeake. So what does a memorial to the planet have to deal with optimism? I've always believed that my memory works are teaching tools. And if we can accurately remember history and be aware of what we're losing, maybe it'll spur us into action. So this is the IUCN quote, what we're facing today. So it's not the species, but it's the habitats as well that we have to be protecting. I'm sorry. It's, and as an artist, getting you to understand things that are missing that you might not even reveal are missing. Um, one scientist said yesterday, songbirds, um, grassland songbirds are in a 40 to 70% decline. So literally the landscapes we've heard as children no longer exists. So how can we protect something if we don't even realize it's disappeared? So it's called shifting baselines or Jared Diamond refers to it as landscape amnesia. So it started with an idea as an artist, could I get to reveal things like that? It's my last memorial, but what if a memorial could be in multiple places simultaneously? First was a permanent installation at the California Academy of Sciences on that same um, outside terrace, actually opposite terrace. Kids love to sit inside, and in it we play over 75 one to two minute what I call science haikus about species and places, quoting from all of the groups, all the scientists, again trying to present the scientific community and the conservation community as a family. We take donations from um, Nat Geo, BBC, Cornell. You hear the animal before you see it. Again, I try to get you to arrest the visual. This is called The Empty Room. It's actually, right now, it's a temporary show that travels. It's in Shanghai at the Himalaya Art Museum right now with bilingual videos. You get to hold the species or place in your hand and to get to learn about it. We also are a guerrilla art project, so we took over the MTV billboard in Times Square on Earth Day one year. I surface on Earth Day with new iterations because I set this up as a not-for-profit. Um, I volunteer for it, and so I tend to sort of keep to Earth Day. There is a nexus for the entire project. It's called whatismissing.org. It starts with an idea of could I build an ecological history of the planet? And every single dot is a story of conservation successes, failures, uh, personal stories, as well as deep dive timelines. But I couldn't go forward with this project without as well balancing with what we can do to help and large, bigger, almost macro thinking about what could be done. You can play with it. You can sort, you can find species, places, rivers. You can also look geolocated or in time. So please go to whatismissing.org. And we highlight ecological histories of cities, rivers, species, because not only do we want to put you in awe of what the planet used to be, that with almost every story of a river or a city, first, you live where it was abundant, first comes sewage, then industrial pollution, then an awareness, legislation, 
and things come back. Once more, always emphasizing how resilient nature is. If we give it a chance, it almost always comes back. The quotes from the Thames, the Thames hasn't been this clean in the last 300 years. Oysters beginning to be able to live and breed again in New York Harbor. So again, this underlying current is of resilience and through conservation. But we also want to make it more close to home. So we ask you, could you connect to us? Could you give us a memory? So I'm just going to go through it. We just linked to Google Earth. So uh, endangered species are linked with timelines. You can learn about lions in Pompeii and then end up in the Colosseum. But we always link to groups that are devoted to conservation successes around the world. And what I wanted to end with is green print. What if we could envision a sustainable future? Like science fiction, it brought us the elevator, the escalator, got us to the moon. What if art could propose ways of thinking about the problems we face in a new way? So I'm just going to hop through it. So what if we rethought the human footprint? What if the entire world population today lived at the density of Manhattan? How much space would we take up? The answer might surprise you. It's the state of Colorado. So is this just a question of population, or is it more a question of land use and resource consumption? So could we envision a map that shows a, balance, that shows a future that balances our needs with the needs of the planet? Could we imagine rearranging the light? And then we take you to examples. Cities around the world consume over 2 thirds of the world's energy and are responsible for 70% of the emissions. Right now, 50% of us live in those cities. By 2050, 75% of us will. So cities become a key answer. So we take you around the world because we believe in giving people hope by showing you it's already in practice all around the world. And by just taking best practices in recycling transit electricity, that's 50% of all climate emissions. So I want to leave you with some numbers. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit of a nudge today on the numbers. This is what World Economic Forum would say it takes to mitigate climate change, 700 billion annually. So as an artist, I couldn't resist. Well, what do we spend 700 billion on annually? So your choice, cigarettes worldwide or weight loss industry and the bottled water industry. What I would say is it might sound like a lot of money, but we're spending that money every single year, and we're basically spending our kids' futures and our future. So again, this is Lester Brown's um, Plan 3.0, and again, comparing it to what we're spending on an annual basis. So all of this is part of green print. You can download every little packet, share it, download it, use it. I just made this information as an artist to say, maybe I can get you to think of it in a new light. For instance, subsidies on fossil fuel industry, oddly, is equivalent to what we need if we really want to turn renewable energy around. But the beauty is, you know, what if defense included defending the planet? Or for this matter, this is from the Headwaters Institute. Fun facts and figures, um, the job creation. For every million dollars, 6.9 in oil and gas, 5.2 in coal, or 20 to 40 in national parks. Which would you rather have in your backyard? So again, we quote and we source at the bottom of each card so that you can use it as well. And again, we went after jobs because, again, the potential for rethinking that. I wanted you to think of things. Everyone's going to go to this. Yes, we've made huge gains in solar, wind, and LED. A clean future now costs less than a dirty one. But also think of other things, like agriculture, which could increase jobs by 30%. And here I go. Whenever I can save two birds with one tree, combining habitat protection with reduction in emissions, that's what I'm after. So this is what regenerative agriculture, no-till agriculture, could potentially absorb as far as CO2 emissions. Or eating less meat. We've all heard about it, but what would that look like if we could eat 20% less meat? That would actually free up 
all the protected land, it's equivalent to all the protected land in North America and over 50% in South America. It's a huge amount. So we like to play with infographics. Couldn't resist putting a couple in from the what you can do's. Who would have guessed a lamb's footprint is as big as a cow and a rabbit was so efficient? It will lead you to an inevitable conclusion, but if you don't want to eat a bug, just ask yourself this. 36% of the global annual fish feed is ground up to feed chickens and pigs. What do you think a free range chicken should be eating? Or for that matter, why do you think they call it fly fishing? So I'm just gonna end with one last thought about wetlands. Because wetlands sequester three times as much carbon as a tropical forest. And it could become our first line of defense in resiliency. And I'll just end with a couple other thoughts about how habitat restoration and ecosystem resiliency provide sustainable and lasting benefits that reduce risks posed to coastal communities from weather events, changing environmental cushion conditions, and potential climate change impacts. And that's all I have today. So thank you very much. I'll just get to the end. And we would love, because a lot of you are on the front lines of conservation, if you could tell us a story. Share with us something you've watched disappear, or better yet, something that's come back. Thank you.